The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, It is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do pray that you would now work in us that comfort that you have stored up for us uh, through ages uh, of eternity past and for ages of eternity future. Uh, Lord, enable us to then comfort others who are in any affliction and with the comfort that you have given to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul Gerhardt is known as the uh, David of German hymnody. He lived during the time of the Thirty Years' War, And so he knew all of the pillage and pestilence, trouble and affliction that came during that period. His wife and three of his children perished during that time. And yet he found great comfort in the gospel. In 1655, he translated Bernard of Clairvaux's, O Sacred Head now wounded. And then the next year, he wrote the words and the music for, Oh, put your trust in God. He found that there was great comfort in the gospel. And astonishingly, his comfort has become our comfort as we have sung the hymns that he wrote in the midst of his grief. Katerina von Schlegel lost her entire family in a wave of the plague in 1752. In the days of grief, immediately afterward, she wrote the hymn, Be Still My Soul. She was comforted by the power of the gospel, Her soul was stilled. And in the generations ever since, as we have sung her hymn, we have found solace in her solace. In 1834, Charlotte Elliott was stricken. She was just 22 years old, but would spend the rest of her life as an invalid in bed. Her faith was deeply shaken. She was visited by her pastor, and the pastor encouraged her in the gospel. She took solace from uh, the words of truth and said, but how, how can I serve him from a sickbed? And he replied, just as you are, my daughter, just as you are. That night, she wrote, just as I am. And it, too, became solace for her and solace for us and for generations afterwards. In 1844, Joseph Scriven 
was on his way home. He had just finished school in Ireland and uh, was making his way uh, near his farm homestead uh, when he found his fiance, who was to be married to him the next day, face down in a stream. She had been thrown by a horse and was killed. In grief, he moved away from Ireland and immigrated to Canada. Eventually, he fell in love again and was set to be married. But one week before the ceremony, his fiancée died of a high fever. His mother back in Ireland was grief-stricken. And so that year in 1855, he wrote her a poem to encourage her. What a friend we have in Jesus. Isn't it astonishing that when we're in the midst of the deepest grief that we can imagine, the comfort that we receive can then suddenly be turned into comfort for others. In 1873, uh, the French ocean liner, the Ville de Havre, sank and 226 of the passengers perished in the North Atlantic, including the four daughters of Horatio and Anna Spafford. But just uh, two years prior, he had lost his business in the great Chicago fire. He was a friend of Dwight L. Moody and uh, was a partner in that work But now it seems he had lost everything. His wife survived. He, uh, in the midst of his grief, famously wrote, It is well with my soul when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. How many Christians in the midst of their grieving, have found comfort in his comfort. In 1910, Luther Bridges uh, was at a Bible conference in Kentucky. It was enormously successful. It was the most fruitful time he had ever had in his preaching ministry. But just as he was about to leave, he uh, got a message from home his wife and three sons perished in a house fire. He immediately sat down and in the midst of his grief cried out to God and suddenly the lyrics to He Keeps Me Singing poured out. In 1923, Thomas Chisholm that was struggling with a debilitating illness. He was forced to step down as a pastor. He wasn't sure what he would or could do. And in the midst of his grief, he wrote the words, to great is thy faithfulness. In 1936, B.B. McKinney, who was a missionary to Brazil, had come home to the United States and received a terrible diagnosis. He would not live through the course of the year. He confided to his friend, R.S. Jones, uh, that that he did not know what he would do next or how many days he had left, but where'er he leads, there I'll go. Jones was inspired And from the comfort that he had received from his brother McKinney, he wrote the words to the great hymn, Where'er he leads, there I'll go. Each of these stories really illustrate for us the essence of the Apostle Paul's message to the Corinthians. God enters into our affliction. God enters into our troubles and our sorrows. And he meets us with his comfort, with his care, with his mercy. And and then that comfort and care and mercy suddenly is transformed into a means for us to comfort others 
in the midst of their afflictions. And in the process, Paul says, our afflictions take on a whole new meaning. They take on a whole new definition. You'll notice in this uh, short passage that there are a number of repeated words. Uh, The word afflictions is repeated four times in just five verses. Uh, The word sufferings is repeated four times in just five verses. And the word comfort is mentioned ten times. Uh, Six times as a noun, four times as a verb. The word is the Greek word parakaleo. And it's oftentimes defined in three different ways. It it can mean to encourage or to cheer. Or secondly, it can mean to exhort, admonish, or entreat. Or third, it can mean to summon or to invoke a sense of calling. Paul uses the word comfort here all three ways. He lets us know that God's comfort to us is a deep encouragement to cheer our heart. He lets us know that God's comfort to us is also an exhortation to walk in faith. It's an admonition to believe that that comfort is sufficient for our needs. And then third, he lets us know that that comfort becomes a summons for us in identifying with the sufferings of Christ to model a gospel-shaped life before a watching world, and particularly for those who are likewise suffering. In verse 3, Paul begins this description of comfort in the Christian life with a doxology. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what he's doing here is using the Old Testament Baraka formula of blessing. And so in the uh, scriptures, uh, we, we read, I will uh, bless the Lord at all times. His pl- praise shall be continually in my mouth. Uh, Psalm 34, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Uh, Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Psalm 103. Uh, We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 115. So Paul is looking back to the Old Testament and in the midst of his afflictions and thinking about the afflictions of the Corinthian church, he rests on that Old Testament blessing, the Baraka blessing. That's his doxology. And he tells us that the reason for his praise is that the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort has met us with his grace. Here, Paul is using another Old Testament formula. He's reminding us of what is decreed over and over and over again in the scriptures. You recall when um, Moses in Exodus chapter 34 uh, received the second set of tablets of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the Lord passed before him and declared, the Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God meets us with his mercy and grace, with his comfort. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Or as Lamentations 3 says, uh, his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, for great is his faithfulness. 
Paul repeats this in Ephesians chapter 2 as he is about to declare the, the wonder of salvation by grace through faith, this not of ourselves. He says, God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He is, as Psalm 68 says, a father to the fatherless. He's a judge for the widows. A God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. So Paul breaks forth in this anthem of praise. In verse 4, he tells us that God comforts us and then he beckons us to imitate him in using that comfort to comfort others. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. And then he says, and and we do so with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God cares for us. He pours out his kindness upon us, and he beckons his people to do likewise. God desires that we follow him, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. We're to emulate him, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. We're to do as he does. Now, engrafted into his family, we're to bear a family likeness before a watching world. In effect, we are to do unto others as he has done unto us. This is at the heart of the ethical principle that underlies the golden rule. If God has forgiven us, then Ephesians 4 says we're to forgive others. If God has loved us, uh, 1 John 4 says, then we are to love others. And we're able to because he first loved us. If he has taught us, Uh, Then Matthew 28 says, then we are to teach others. If he is born witness to us, uh, then we are to bear witness to others, John 15. If he's laid down his life for us, then we are to lay down our lives for one another, 1 John 3. If God has comforted us, then we are to comfort others. In a sense, this is the great priestly calling that every believer has. And whenever God commands the priestly nation of Israel to imitate him in ensuring justice for the wandering homeless, uh, the alien, the sojourner, he reminded them that they themselves were once despised, rejected, and homeless. Exodus 22, Exodus 23, Leviticus 19. It's only by the grace and the mercy of God that they had been redeemed from that low estate, Deuteronomy 24. In the great Shema, the declaration of faith in uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we have this declaration, I have given you houses that you did not build and, and wells that you did not dig and gardens that you did not plant. Therefore, do not forget the grace that has been poured out upon you. Israel was to fulfill their calling to live lives of merciful service. And the promise was, if they did that, then, according to Psalm 41, they themselves would be abundantly blessed. Uh, This is the lesson that Jesus was driving at in the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. You remember that uh, story? Servant comes to his master. Uh, He owes him a treasure. He has no means to repay. And his master forgives him. Servant walks away and then runs into a fellow servant who owes him a pittance. He has no mercy. He will not comfort with the comfort with which he has been blessed. And uh, as a result, he throws his fellow servant into prison. 
The master hears of this and is outraged. He simply not fulfilled his purpose. The moral of the parable is crystal clear. The needy around us are, in a sense, living symbols of our own former helplessness and privation. We are therefore living symbols of God's justice, mercy, and compassion. We are to do as he has done. God has set the pattern by his gracious working in our lives. Now, we are to follow that pattern by serving others in the power of the indwelling spirit, according to John chapter 14. Now, in verse 5 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, uh, Guthrie m- makes this application by, by showing how uh, we actually are identifying with Christ's own sufferings as we suffer and Christ's own comfort as we comfort. He says, uh, as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Uh, uh, George Guthrie in his commentary uh, says this. He says, um, it is best to read this genitive form as reflecting the Christian's identification with Christ and his sufferings. That is, the sufferings experienced in association with Christ. It may well be, he says, that this perspective was birthed in Paul's experience on the Damascus Road, where Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? He wasn't persecuting Christ, of course. He was persecuting other believers. But out of this experience, Guthrie says, Paul came to understand that persecution against Christ's people, Christ's body, Christ's bride, is a direct assault on Christ himself. As Christ's people follow Christ's path of suffering and identification with him. For Paul, then, being in a world hostile to Christ means an experience of overflowing difficulties in life and ministry. It is only in the experience of suffering that we find the answer to suffering and meaning in our suffering. And so... That we have over and over again uh, the declaration uh, that uh, uh, we are to put on tender mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness and long suffering, as Colossians 3 says. We're to become a father to the poor and we're to search out the case of the stranger, as Job 29 says. Uh, We're to love our neighbors as ourselves, uh, Mark 12, and we are to rescue the perishing. Proverbs 24. We're to remember the persecuted, Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 13. And so it's entirely appropriate. In fact, it is incumbent upon us to remember our brothers and sisters who are in prison right now in places like China and North Korea, in places all throughout the Middle East. I can remember uh, very well, the time that I was in Kirkuk in, uh, in northern Iraq, just shortly after uh, Saddam Hussein was overthrown, and we were doing a Bible conference, and there were uh, Christian brothers who, who were gathered there who had suffered terribly for years. And uh, at one point in one of the services, they hatched a plan to come and bless uh, those of us who had come from the West uh, to minister to them. They had, uh, they had chains, and they had uh, cut these chains into small pieces, and they came in singing a song of liberty, shaking their chains, and reminding us uh, that uh, brothers and sisters all around the world were still in chains, though theirs were broken, uh, they would hold themselves in solidarity to their brothers. You may not know this, But today, January the 16th, in the nation of Canada, our next-door neighbors, just to the north, 
A new law has been passed. C4, it is called. C4 makes it a federal crime to preach the gospel of liberty from sexual addictions, gender dysphoria, or sexual dysfunctions like homosexuality. It makes it a federal crime to teach, preach, or counsel that. In Canada, what's to be our call? At a time when university professors are being canceled left and right, at a time when, uh, uh, when people who own flower shops and bake shops are, are being told that they have to violate their conscience, how are we as Christians to respond? This is what Paul is talking about to the Corinthians. They lived at a time of sore oppression. And what Paul was saying was, in, in the midst of these difficult circumstances, We have gospel hope. Therefore, we can take courage. We can understand that persecutions will come. All those who live godly before Christ Jesus will be persecuted, Paul tells us. But in the midst of the sorrowing, God gives us deep consolation and rest in his grace. And that deep consolation and rest uh, becomes identification with Christ himself. In verse 6, Paul says that all of these trials and tribulations, this suffering and all of these afflictions, take on new significance and meaning. Our comfort becomes your comfort, he says. And your comfort uh, becomes Ours. As a result, he says in verse 7, therefore, our hope is unshaken. Our hope for you and our hope for us as we share in his comfort. It is well. It is well with our soul. Whatever our lot. He has taught us to say, it is well, it is well with our souls. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one Sabbath morning, he says, I preached from the text, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And though I did not say so, yet I preached my own experience. I heard my own chains clank when I tried to preach to my fellow prisoners in the dark. I could not tell why I was brought into such a, an awful horror of darkness. But the next day, Monday evening, a man came to see me who bore all the marks of despair upon his countenance. His hair seemed to stand straight up. His eyes were ready to start from their sockets. He said to me after a little parlaying, I never before in all my life heard any man speak who seemed to know my heart. Mine is a terrible case, but on Sunday morning, you painted me true to life. You preached as if you had been given a glimpse inside my soul. Spurgeon writes, by grace, that night he was saved from suicide. And that night he was led into gospel light and liberty. Spurgeon says, I know that I could not have led him if I had not myself been confined in the dungeon of darkness in which he too lay. My sorrows were met with comfort, gospel hope, and my comfort became his comfort. It's an astonishing truth.
Paul is speaking to the Corinthians who are in the midst of dire, dire distress. He says, there is comfort. God will meet you with grace and mercy, but he doesn't just meet you. He, he fills you up to overflowing so that the comfort that spills out to others, it becomes a fountainhead of kindness uh, to those who are hurting around you. I, I don't know about you, but I look back at the worst seasons of my life. And those are the ones that made me. Uh, those, those lonely times, those dark nights of the soul, those you know, nights of crumpled pillows sobbing have been transformed somehow, some way into a means of speaking to others and opens up avenues of, of ministry that I would have never known if I had not suffered those things that I did. Now, it is possible that we look at a passage of scripture like this and just turn it into a moralism. Okay? I got trouble, so I've got to, I got to turn this trouble into something. Misery loves company, so I'm going to take these lemons and I'm going to make lemonade. That, that would be a nice moralistic application of this passage. But I want you to notice in the text, there are no imperatives in the text. Did you notice that? There are no commands. Paul doesn't say to the Corinthians, okay, so in light of this, here's what you need to do. Here are the seven things that every Christian ought to do when they have trouble. Just, there's none of that. That's moralism. What Paul wants to do is proclaim to the Corinthians the whole gospel to the whole of life. And so this is not an imperative, this is an indicative. He's telling us what Christ has done, what God the Father has done, the God of all comfort, the God of all mercy. He's telling us that we came to faith by grace, this not of ourselves. Our redemption in the gospel is the result of a one-way love the Father, to us. Our forgiveness for sins comes to us by grace. That this, not of ourselves. That this is the gospel purity that that Paul wants to proclaim. It's a one-way love. We receive comfort in all of our afflictions. By grace, because of the character and nature of God, uh, because of who he is, not because of who we are or what we have done. As a consequence, uh, Paul wants the Corinthians to see that even in their afflictions and even in their sorrows, they're to walk by grace. He's showing us that our lives, because of the gospel, can take the shape of of the gospel. In our afflictions, we identify with the one who is afflicted for us. And his comfort uh, gives us solace, so much solace uh, that we have reserves to extend that solace to others. It's the gospel through and through from beginning to end. Jesus Christ has come and he has set us free for all eternity from our sins and our iniquities, but in this present life, from all those things which chain us and constrain us from walking the joyous Christian life. The uh, story of William Cooper is a pitiful story. Cooper was supremely alert to the reality that God moves in a mysterious way. According to John Piper, uh, the life of Cooper was one long accumulation of mental pain and anguish. Nevertheless, in fits and in starts, uh, from 
a difficult beginning to bitter end, the poet's faith enabled him to trust that God was working wonders even in the midst of what Tim Challies has called this mysterious and maddening providence. In 1767, when Cooper was uh, moved uh, to uh, the little village of Olney uh, to recuperate from a fit of a mental illness to be pastored and discipled by John Newton, he managed to turn his deep melancholy and his poetic introspection into a collaborative project with Newton to create a hymn book to be used by their parish church. It's the hymn book where uh, Amazing Grace had its first appearance and Calm Content had its first appearance. Eventually, the only hymnal would include a host of great hymns. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds, glorious things of thee are spoken. The Coopers included, there is a fountain filled with blood. Oh, for a closer walk with God. There is a safe and secret place. But it was in the midst of his deepest grief and his greatest mental anguish Uh, that he wrote, God moves in a mysterious way. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings upon your head. We sing that hymn, and somehow what was his comfort in the midst of his anguish and afflictions becomes our comfort in the midst of our anguish and afflictions. And the gospel is portrayed powerfully afresh. Paul says, there is grace that is greater than all of our sin and there is grace and comfort that is greater than all our suffering and he meets us so that we then may overflow with that grace to all those around us that's the whole gospel for the whole of life This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.